agenda, set goals, approve personal budget, personnel and budgets, make policy, and provide oversight. We are not here to manage or solve individual problems. Management is responsibility of the superintendent. As a board, we believe that we must educate every child, provide every child the greatest opportunity to learn, maintain a safe and secure environment, mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically. These are our core values, and we appreciate your interest in the students of CISD. All right. We're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one Mr. Chambers, would you say the blessing for us? Absolutely. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity of gathering. We ask that you would conti um, continue to cover us and keep us um, safe throughout our travels and throughout our days, Father. We thank you that you have um, a core group of people that have the children's best interests at heart. And we ask that you would just continue to, to lead God and direct us in the right directions. We ask all these things, your son, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Meryl, I have three audience for guests. Is that all I have so far? Okay. I'm going to read uh, an introduction to public comment and then I, I will call up the three people who have asked to speak today. The CISD Board of Trustees encourages comments about the district from citizens of the district, from district employees, and from other members of the public. Anyone wishing to speak may do it so at this time. The board asks that each participant's comments pertain to public education and be no longer than three minutes per person. The board also respectfully requests that the speaker refrain from mentioning other students or parent and staff members' names when addressing their concerns. Under the Texas Open Meetings Act, the board is not permitted to discuss or act upon any issues that are not posted on the agenda for tonight's meeting. This means the board members are unable to deliberate, ask questions, provide you with a, with a response, or take any action relating to your comments. If an issue mentioned is listed on tonight's agenda, the board's deliberation of the issue will be deferred until the appropriate time during the meeting. In addition, the board has adopted complaint policies that are designed to secure at the lowest administrative level a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. Complaints brought by employees, students, or parents may be brought in accordance with our local school board policy. Each of these processes provides that if a resolution cannot be achieved administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as properly posted agenda item. Copies of our district policy on public participation in meetings and filing complaints can be found on our website. If you need assistance with these policies or processes, please call Merrill, Harrells, Merrill Harrison in the superintendent's office. Okay. So, Ms. Branch, will you be in charge of time? Thank you. Okay, I've got three people. The first is a Miss Daniqua Miller. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Daniqua Miller. I'm here today to present my son is named for Christian Walker. He's been in speed ever since he was uh, three years old. <laughs> And we've been having a transitioning person come to us before he got out of elementary, before he got out of uh, elementary, he went to college and so forth and so forth. The last, this year, we haven't had any communication with nobody for transition. We, uh, we actually reached out uh, to this one lady that works at the Texas Workforce. She gave me some information about 
a workshop that was going on at uh, Dallas University. So we went to that workshop and it was an actual helpful workshop to me as my son is about to graduate. Because when he get older, he's gonna still need some of my guidance, but still be out of his home. My son is high functioning autism. And um, if y'all see him around, y'all might not even know unless you just really start talking to him. So I went, I had to find out a lot of stuff on my own. And because I had to find out a lot of stuff on my own, a lot of parents have reached out to me to ask me, how did I go by getting his driver license? How did I go by getting this done and this done? I feel like Corsicana as a community has failed ever since we had a workshop in 2019 before COVID hit. And I feel like if that workshop was back up and running, it will help a lot of parents who don't have the resources that I had to help him in the long run. So I'm just asking the board to be in consideration of, it don't even have to be twice a year, it can be close to the end of the year to help some parents that don't know how to help their kids transition from one school to another school, because it is hard. My son, he has a very hard time with any change. Like right now, we're going through- You have one minute remaining. Okay. We go, we right now we are going through the Texas workforce. So to kind of get him ready to be out on his own for as a job. Some people don't even know that. I didn't know about the work program for kids with disability until I went to the workshop over the spring break. So I was just asking and kind of pleading with the board to kind of bring a workshop or something to help some parents like myself need help with kids with disabilities who is high functioning. Thank you. Oh yeah, one more thing. I know I got probably like 45 seconds. And to, like I know we have Columbus Day, but kind of talk to the counselors about um, fair tickets to the counselor. It's the counselor jobs to call to the fair to get the tickets for, if they say we have 2,000 students, they will give the kids 2,000 students. I'm a community, I don't care, I will rent a bus to take whoever kid need to go to the fair. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next, we have Mr. Is that, um, Jim Hume. Thank you, President Brown and school board members. And thank you for your service to the community. You don't have an easy job maintaining the integrity and quality of the school system. Two questions which would have to be answered in a different form at a later date. First question, the recent school bond issue of two parts failed. Most people feel for a variety of reasons. What did it cost the district in terms of advertising and promotion to try to get that thing to pass. Your mailers, your flyers, your signs, your newspaper ads. I think the public would be interested in knowing that. Second question, with respect to staff. Earlier this year, the district lost a very respected and successful person in Hal Watson, who is a friend and part of our family. He was the athletic director and head football coach. He left, so you hired a new football coach. Then you hired an athletic director, which seems like a, a reverse process because most ADs like to be in on the hiring of a new coach. You can ask any of them. The budget question is, what is the cost, plus or minus, for the two staff positions versus the one staff position. Thank you. And Ms. Tracy Jordan. Good afternoon. I come here today as a concerned citizen, a former campus principal, 
and now a grandparent. I want to bring awareness to you and the, to those who are present here today about two concerns. While I was happy to hear that the school board meetings have been pushed back to five from the past 430, I still think that it makes it very difficult and sometimes impossible for community members to attend for those at work. They simply cannot be involved in the school process. In order to involve all stakeholders in the school process, I believe it's necessary to move back this start time. It's my understanding the time was pushed back to accommodate the board members. And while this is admirable, it only accounts for seven of thousands of the community members of CISD. As it is, it appears to the public that you do not want to be transparent with what goes on in the school board meetings. In comparison, Ennis starts at 7, Mildred starts at 6, Rice 6, Blooming Grove 6.30, and Dallas ISD 6 o'clock. Secondly, as a grandparent, I'm now very concerned with the safety of elementary campuses especially. In lieu of the Uvalde shootings, I think we all are. Elementary campus safety must be addressed. Recently, Dr. Frost was quoted in the paper stating that 11 resource officers are hired and that are on each campus. While that's true, and it's stated that they were, they're posted on each campus, and that is true. However, I can speak as a former campus principal and have seen with my own eyes that SROs are not on campus all day, every day. They often are not there for drop off. They often are not there for pick up. You have one minute, Renee. And they are pulled, thank you. And they are pulled for things often not notifying campus principals. After the SROs have accumulated comp time, they often don't even show up for work, leaving campuses very vulnerable to all safety concerns. This is troubling in our current state and climate and must be addressed. SRO should and must be on campus all day, every day, when the first student arrives until that last student leaves. Safety of all students and staff from start to finish of every day must be a top priority. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. I appreciate you coming forward. All right. We are going to the superintendent's report. All the items that are included would be included in the superintendent's report or agenda items. Okay, great. All right. Mr. Bulware, you are first with the staffing report. All right. Thank you. Dr. Frost, distinguished members of the board, uh, I'm just going to give you an update of where we're at on staffing going into the 22-23 uh, school year with uh, the, the state of hiring educators all over the place being what it is. And I know what everybody hears and sees. I just want to make sure that you know where we're sitting right now. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you about is going to be uh, our, our, our certified classroom teachers is specifically the numbers that I'm going to talk to you about. Right now the district is in need of 19 uh, certified teachers. And that's a, that number is district-wide. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a breakdown of that here in just a second. That's, that's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty well spread out over the district. Um, we need, and, and when I say need, make sure you understand uh, the definition of the word need. For us to transition into business as usual uh, from last year, this is the number that, that would put us as, at being fully staffed. There's still several, several other things that we can do in terms of some creative scheduling, uh, some creative things that we can do on class sizes on some of our campuses who have not had high numbers in their classrooms up to this point. Um, offerings at the secondary level, there's lots of routes that we can transition to if need be. Uh, however, with the job that our principals are doing right now in the hiring process and the push that they're making, I feel like we're going to get the people that we need uh, before August 1, just to be honest with you. Uh, but that number broke down is, uh, is six positions at Collins Intermediate, two positions at the high school, three positions at the middle school, three positions at Navarra Elementary, two positions at Fannin Elementary, 
Uh, we're fully staffed at Carroll. Sam Houston needs three positions <coughs> to be filled, uh, and we're good at Bowie. Uh, as of this week, we're fully, <coughs> hopefully, fully staffed on our uh, ad administrative side with our assistant principals that we've taken. Understand this too, that several of these holes on these campuses now are because we're taking some of the best that we have and moving them into administrative roles, which I do believe is, is the right thing to do. Uh, we've made some really, really good hires as uh, assistant principals this year. Um, so some of those wounds are self-inflicted, is, is what I'm saying. Uh, several of those positions that are open now are people that we have tried uh, to work with for, for several months now to allow them a longer timeline to continue to repeat test to try to keep on staff that, that have just had difficulty getting those passed uh, up, up to this point. We've already exercised our emergency certificate status with those individuals, uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty good sized number of those. They've, they've given us some information from TEA uh, as of this past week. There are some waiver possibilities for those people that I just spoke of that would, if we can, put into play. And uh, I've mentioned it to Dr. Frost today that we could we could virtually uh, cut this number uh, about in half and and retain some of the people that will otherwise have to have to let go for for certification purposes um let me give you some numbers on our turnover rate over the last three years just to give you an idea of where we're sitting uh this year we uh, had uh, 82 end of year resignations last year we had 72 end of year resignations and the year before we had 53, which would have been right in the middle of COVID. Uh, and then in 1819, before that, we had 70 end of year resignations. So we're really not far from our average uh, re resignation number on, on the year. Uh, we'd always love for it to be better than it, than it is right now, but I think that stability and leadership positions plays a big role in that. And I think it's a part of the reason that we did get about 10 more resignations this year. We had, we had a lot of turnover uh, in leadership positions on the campuses, uh, but I do feel like that we've put people in place on those campuses that are gonna sustain and they're, 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 they're gonna be long-term hires, gonna be good for kids and staff, and that's what keeps people here uh, at the end of the day. Are there any questions? So if, uh, since we are a district that does 100% um, qualified would we have to make an exception if we are doing what TE, TEA is granting by allowing these teachers an additional year there there's two routes that we could go because uh, we're talking core teachers here um, we could as a district of innovation we could revise our document and allow us to uh, locally certify core people which we've not done up to this point and 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 uh, are still attempting to hire high, highly qualified individuals um, or the new waiver system would require us to apply for an individual waiver for uh, every teacher that had, was not fully certified that would have to be signed off on by Dr. Frost and the school board. And Shade, I'd like to just add that that's one of the things that we've held solid to is for core classes, math, science, language, arts, social studies, um, full certification. Most, te most of the districts, because of the teacher shortage, have already started allowing um, people who have not come through the traditional certification routes to be in those classrooms, but we have not done that as of yet. And I'm very proud that we've been able to not do that, um, but the, the teacher, um, the test has changed significantly over the last several years, and it's just a much more difficult test. In addition, uh, the reading academies um, have required a lot of work on teachers, and I, my, personally, my personal opinion, and I've talked to several teachers who have said, I'm just not going to do that 40 hours of the reading academy. I'm gonna go ahead and retire. So um, that's just some, those are just factors, and just, they're just there. They're the situations that we live with, uh, but they do make it, more difficult to become a teacher and to stay a teacher. Uh, TEA put out a report and, uh, over findings on teachers that were getting out of education this past week and said that 40% of the teachers that were getting out of education were getting out because of the Reading Academy. So it's I guess my question is, um, you know, now that we're in this situation, what can we do, and I know you, for your department as a district, you know, be, getting ahead of the game. Because like you're saying, we know this is statewide, we know this is nationwide. 
So as a district, we should start thinking way ahead that, hey, what kind of, what does our workforce look like in the next five or 10 years? Because we know our young people that we have now, you know, what are they, are they gonna wanna be teachers? Are they gonna wanna be educators? Sure. So we should be asking those questions as far as what does our workforce look like in the next, you know, I because I don't believe in now, it, it's, it's happening now. So we now we gotta figure it out. So we no, I'm with just you. keep having the conversation of what, what can we do to catch up or stay up, stay on top of it. No, and I believe we're doing it. Like just in the last two weeks, we've hired six six local kids that that we've been working on for a year as they're finishing up college. That come back, they're not certified, but we're helping them through the certification process. They're going to roll right back into CISD, uh, uh, all in the classroom. Several of them coaching, helping in our in our programs. I'm pretty excited about. It. So, I'm with you. But I just want to make sure that our that our young people that we're telling our young people it's okay to be an educator. It's okay. So those that are going to be here in Corsica County, they're going to stay here in Corsica County because I believe those that want to be here are going to be here. So let's 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 talk the language to them that if they're in a if they're in the, at the high school juniors seniors, let's just talk let's talk to them about hey y'all can stay here and help our community, you know, get educated. Our young people get educated because I, I I get it. They want all the big lights. Want to go to Metroplex, the city, and all that. But a lot of them coming back home mm -hmm. because they they realize the big lights they're all big, big lights. You know, so I just, that's just what I want to see for our, for our district, is to talk to our young people that are, that, that are going to be here. Because they're going to be here. Some of them are going to stay here. Absolutely. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Six is a big number to hire of there kids that are fresh out of college that are our kids this year coming back. And Monday, you're attending a um, job fair. Yes, ma'am. At McLennan. Yes, ma'am. Where, where I, I think we'll have an opportunity to get some people uh, to come over out of their surf program. It's, it's commutable. Uh, because of where they're located so I'm hoping to get a couple of hires out of that Brad Thomason actually beat us to the punch on it he uh, he contacted them somehow talked to him into giving him the list of uh, hireable applicants that they've got and he's got I think five interviews set up this week so we're moving we're, we're the process is rolling any more questions I think that's good Shade thank you very much all right thank you all and good luck. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Now to the first reading of the TASB update 119. 119 addresses six specific areas. Um, the first one is, re and the first one is not anything new. It uh, codifies the electronic <sighs> records retention process. Um, in the SHAC committee, we have um, addressed that, and you heard a presentation from SHAC that included this information and the policy modifications um, in the last board meeting or two. Um, we are now required to report, G, um, not required to report GT funding specifically and separately. It's still a part of the budget and a part of the audit, but that's a modification to the reporting requirements there. Um, and then there's a modification to the statement of non-discrimination and clarification to the the Title IX um, requirements and statements. So those are things that um, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have and we'll bring it back for action on this item at the next board meeting. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Frost this time? Thank you. All right, now we're going on to the TASB delegate and alternate. So each year, the board selects a representative to TASB as well as an alternate, and it's just done by nomination and second, just like any other board action. I think that Barbara Kelly has been an excellent um, delegate for us with TASB. Um, she's extremely knowledgeable and um, willing to learn any and all things um, related to school board districts. So I would not I would move that we nominate Barbara Kelly once again as our TASB delegate. Is there a second? A second. Right, we have a we have a motion and we have a second to nominate Barbara Kelly as our delegate for TASB. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Barbara Kelly, you will continue to be our TASB delegate. Okay, now we need to get a, an alternate. Kathy has served, served as an alternate. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I so, may have, yeah. Yeah, so Go I would ahead. like to nominate Kathy as an alternate. Is there a second? Second. 
All right, there's a motion and a second to have Kathy Branch as our alternate for our TASB delegate. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes have it. Kathy Branch, you are our TASB del alternate delegate. All right. Thank you very much. All right, our 2022 graduate report. I'll ask Mr. Johnson to come to the um, podium and um, perform the graduate report sure. for the board, please. Good evening, Dr. Frost, Board of Trustees. I am uh, J.P. Johnson, and I'm over at CMR for the district, which is College Career Military Readiness, if anybody was wondering that. I'm going to present uh, specifically tonight our, uh, something over our industry-based certification, and we call those IBCs, or industry-based certification. Before I start, I'm going to talk about why they are important. Our IBCs are important really for a couple reasons. Um, number one, our students. It's important for our students to receive a certification. Looks good on a resume. Uh, can help them with a job and possibly even lead to a career. Um, and then also uh, accountability. Uh, TEA has tied our industry-based certifications to, C to our CCMR, which by the way is 40%. CCMR is 40% of our uh, accountability for the high school. So another reason why it's important. Okay. So total certifications this past year, we had 750. That's a lot if you're wondering, that is a whole lot. Okay, I kind of broke them up, or we broke them up into a few different categories. Digital certifications, you know, you see a number of Microsoft certifications up there, um, and then some Adobe. If you want me to stop, I'll go back a little bit. That tells you how many of each. Then automotive has a lot of certifications as well. Automotive, uh, particularly there's a large number in that automotive service safety, you see we uh, gave out 153 of those, or students earned 153 of those. And then the others are really more vehicle service, preparing a vehicle for service, the Lyft Institute, um, but a number of, of certifications come from our automotive, automotive programs. And then the last one, we just kind of put them together, just additional certifications. They all come from could, uh, some criminal justice, there's some medical certifications on there. Uh, culinary arts is on there. Floral design, um, finance, construction, and welding are all on there. So 750, um, and that is it. Any yeah, I, I was just, be able to answer. well, yeah. I was gonna let you know that um, back the phlebotomy, yes. we interviewed, um, when we were interviewing for Colin Scholarship, uh -huh. we had a lot of kids who had just passed their phlebotomy test, oh, and they all talked about it with us, and yeah. um, they love, love the new instructor that yeah, came in yeah. that had a lot of great mm -hmm. things to say about her, and we're excited about, you know, most of them, of course, were our in, our, you know, nursing majors, but they were um, very excited about her. And so Great. I thought we needed to pass that on to you. Thank that you. And I, I know we'll have more next year because she came, I guess, mid-year that I'm sure we'll have more. And thank you for everybody who donated arms uh, for that, too. Do you know if, I know you haven't been in your position long, but okay. do you know if the 750 is an increase or decrease over previous years? It is an increase from last year. Okay. Um, we had just a little over 650, somewhere around there last year. Now, I will say this, in uh, complete transparency, 750 is a lot, like I said. However, while they're important for our students, TEA only recognizes some of these. TEA puts out a list that they will put out next year, actually, I'm sorry, next month, actually, that I'll get. Um, and when it comes to our accountability, TEA says it has to be from this list with this vendor. Otherwise, honestly, we don't even care. So not all of those are on that list. However, they're still important for our students. So next year, we'll certainly make sure, and we'll continue to make sure our teachers really know, hey, do what you can and do your best to pull from that list because um, apparently it's going to be tied. Well, it's always been tied to accountability, but maybe even more important um, this year. Do you know if they, um they update that list to as we see trends like Barbara's talking about yes, they, you know obviously we need to, to start trying to recruit our students at a, at a younger age to get into education do they update that list to kind of change as our um, as the environment changes and they the need tell us they do mm -hmm. so I'm sure they do uh, and, and again I, I think it's every year so we're getting a new one and I was just at a training last week where they talked about that and they said they spent hours and hours on the different labor markets because each right. different regional labor markets as well right um, but there are 200 
44, I can't remember. There's a lot of uh, vendors on that list, so it's not just a small list. It's a pretty Because I know this on here, I, was, I know like maybe a couple years ago, Mercy Day, Mercy Day was a big thing for young people, and I don't know. They still get certified in that as nurses' aid? Nurses' aid. Uh, no, a couple years ago, nurses' aid, they were doing that. CNA. 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 I think they switched more to the phlebotomy, and then there was some um, that were going to do the certified nurses' aid. Uh, but with the new instructor coming in, they thought only they thought only one would be able to get accomplished. Um, so the, the teacher that was leaving and the new teacher got like their heads together and called them phlebotomy would be uh, more beneficial to them. Well, and didn't it make an impact also when they moved the nursing program from Navarro College um, here on, in Corsicana over to Waxahachie? I know that we had some several conversations about that, um, and I talked to different people at the I guess college. Because we have all these different clinics that are opening up now. You know, and I know they're going to need workforce. You know, so, so the last two or maybe even three years, the plan has always been for them to get both. So these same kids that were getting the phlebotomy would have also been getting that other one. Um, but with the instructor change, and then that, the, the new instructor was moving from, I think Wisconsin maybe. She was, she's um, from out of state. So there was about a month layover where they didn't have an instructor. So they just didn't think it would be possible for them to pass those tests. And those tests are, those are the most expensive tests that TEA allows. So that'll be something we'll definitely look into next year for sure. The person who employed several nurses at mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you firsthand that the lobby, they tell me every single time that it has been the absolute best thing they ever took. Good. Sorry. Uh, the, phle the phlebotomy was the best thing they ever took. Um, all the nursing, all the nursing students say that because they go into class knowing how to start those lines. They're light years ahead of all the rest of them, and where they can go and spend more time studying other things because they can start it quickly. They don't have to learn the whole process over. Oh, okay, great. So I hear that one is kind of difficult too. It's just one to pass. Anything else? No, thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to number D, student code of conduct. Okay, we began a conversation um, that stemmed from safety and security at the last board meeting. And there are several different areas in the student code of conduct um, that several different areas are included in the student code of conduct. One of these is dress code. And so that's what the conversation is about tonight. This is not an action item, it's an information item, unless you choose um, to. Um, make some decisions. So the first and probably the most significant thing um, that we've heard about is hoodies. So I'll just kind of go down through a list that I took from the Code of Conduct and um, let the board address those and share your thoughts. I would like to, I would like to call up Scott Doring and Brad Thompson and JP. Uh, please come up here and tell us your thoughts on hoodies and how that affects the high school and middle school, uh, if you would please. Can I may I add one thing sure. with um, Scott? We had a conversation this afternoon about another idea that he might like to throw out there. So while you're up at the podium, if you don't mind sharing your additional thoughts on the other idea. Sure. Um, as far as hoodies go, I think we talked about it last time. Um, I don't see the need, and because of the safety issue um, with hoodies and, and students, if they have them on, they're going to pull them on, and it's it's a constant it's a constant battle keeping those off. Um, I think if we were to ban hoodies um, in our district, I think it would make us safer, uh, and it would uh, it would also help our teachers and our administration uh, focus their efforts in other in other places. Now, my other idea is kind of a give and take. Uh, we're taking the hoodies away from the students. My other idea is to see if we could make. Uh, Corsicana Tiger spirit shirts, t-shirts worn Monday through Friday. Uh, keep keep the dress code the same, but if you wear a Corsicana Tiger t-shirt, uh, then you can wear that instead of a collared shirt. I think this will do good in a lot of ways. One, uh, for morale of our students and for school spirit, um, 
we're taking the hoodies away, but I, I promise you, if they don't have to wear a collared shirt, uh, that will that would help our students. Uh, they would change their attitude a little bit, I think. I think they would appreciate that. And um, we could sell a lot of, of course, Canada Tigers t-shirts <laughs> also. Uh, but that's one thing I just wanted to kind of throw out there that I think would be a good kind of give and take. Uh, we're going to take your hoodies all, away from you. But um, you can wear a Course Canada Tiger T-shirt Monday through Friday, no problem. So I do think it's important to note too, and, and um, I forgot someone mentioned to me that with vaping being as prevalent as it is and being an ongoing battle with students, um, it, how, wearing a hoodie allows you to vape um, and blow the they air under them. into the hoodie. It's other um, places to hide them too, um, but yeah, that, that's true. Absolutely. I, I will just say piggybacking on the uh, the t-shirt idea um, I think getting rid of the hoodies the biggest issue is going to be there's a lot of students that have one or two hoodies and zero school shirts um, and that's what they've planned on buying um, but they all have five course of can of t-shirts they've got one for every field day and football camp and whatever else they have five course of can of t-shirts so the financial hit to the families in the community is not going to be as bad if we allow them to do that um, and then I mean, the, the hood issues is kind of obvious. The biggest thing is that just by habit, they, they're going to put the, the kids that have zero write-ups all school year, you have to remind to take their hoods off. Um, and then when they have their hood on and they have a mask on, uh, there's no, you cannot identify someone like that. It could be your brother, and you, it'd be very hard to tell. So it is a big safety issue. Is there anything else that you see being, you know, in the halls that you think would be something we need to consider making an adjustment to the dress code or or putting in that it's just simply we don't allow that no the the, the only the only thing uh, that, that can be an issue are earbuds and and that can be a safety issue because mm -hmm. students can't hear you right and you know they're hidden and for girls, they're really hidden with their hair. Right? And you can holler at someone and they cannot hear you. Um, earbuds would be something that we talked about. We had a principal's conference last week. A lot of people were talking about um, that for safety what may be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, I know we talked about it last week. And, you know, the cell phones, a lot of talk about that at the principal's conference this week. Um, it's just a... You know, a lot of a lot of districts are going to, uh, you know, cell phones that you can have your cell phone, but it cannot be seen during the day. So, like, you can have it on you, on your person, but if it's seen, you know, you can get in trouble for it. Uh, but just, you know, no one's really. Some people are trying to, to ban them, but right. I just don't know what the safety is. I know a lot of parents would probably not be for that. Um, so, so are they requiring them from what you? her to be off or just out of off and out of sight <laughs> okay out of sight in your pocket in your backpack if you pull it out in the hallway you're in trouble if you pull it out at lunch they're not letting them use it at lunch the big thing too is you know everyone thinks about the cell phone just like texting things like that but you know a lot of our uh, bullying issues things like that mm -hmm. happen over the cell phone right yeah. it's not happening face to face or it's happening through social media on chats things like that so that's how they plan uh, stuff exactly so and that's and that's exactly. kind of you know a lot of the problems that are, are caused throughout the day sometimes are totally electronic right so um you know that's a lot of the communication that we heard too down there that you know some people are trying to do that but wouldn't that be more work for the teachers? I mean, the teachers would have to police that. And I, I think my concern is that the teachers are already having to police and take care of so much that I'm, I'm fearful of putting something else on their plate that they're responsible for, you know? And, so, and I'll be honest with you, some teachers use cell phones in a, in a good way in their classroom. Uh, a lot of teachers are able to use cell phones and, and uh, let the students use cell phones within their lesson and things like that. and and can do that in a good way so um, yeah it's you know it's like any dress code issue it, it's it's something extra that they would would have to look at um, it's just you know basically in the policy the policies that I've seen basically if you see the cell phone you take it up 
and some districts charge to get it back some districts make your parents come to get it back and it's, there's a whole deal with that also now, I'm not saying that we should do that I'm just I'm throwing some stuff out there you asked what some of the things are safety wise that's you know they're talking about cell phones right. buds hoodies that's the big thing and I would think as a teacher um, if you know you come in my class you put your cell phone away because I need to focus on educating you not worrying if you're videoing me or um, whatever else or or you're snapping or doing whatever they do um, to me I would appreciate that as a teacher is to put it away or it's not allowed policy I mean, your, good classroom man, your, your good classroom managers are, are handling that though they are they're you, they're either making you turn them in when you come in. We have teachers that do that without the policy. You come in, you put your phone in a, a carrier, uh, it stays there, you can pick it up on your way out, and that's part of their classroom management. So some uh, your good classroom managers can usually handle that in their classroom. We're also say we left it up to the teachers. They get to decide it's their classroom. If you don't want to see them, uh, then that's up to you, and some of them will do that. And for some, it's not an issue at all. And for some, it is, and it's a matter there too. So you're right. It's, and in the middle school, one thing that I thought was really good when I got over there is there's kids that have abused uh, having a cell phone on them. And there's a list of maybe 12 kids. When you walk into campus, you go see Ms. Jones in the front office and you hand her your cell phone. Um, if you come in and say, oh, I forgot my cell phone, something like that. You um, say it's a privilege, not a right. right. Yeah. So, so if they've already abused it, already gotten in trouble for that, they can bring a cell phone to school, um, but then they've got to turn it in. And I think it's Works yeah. pretty well. We get with the parent and try to um, get, let the parent decide if you want your kid to have it, he's got to turn it in. Or most parents would say, no, I'm keeping that at home. Right. You know, we're really, we're supposed to be really kind of preparing these young people for the real world. And when they go on some of these road first places, these places, some of them, you cannot have a cell phone out. Absolutely. So we kind of like, we do, we give it, we are doing a disservice to them because we're not really preparing them for real life, especially when they go on the real work course. Or you can't have them out, or you won't have a job. <laughs> Absolutely. Question. So I know we're gonna just want to go back to the hoodies real quick, um, and it could be a crazy question, but what are, what are the what's the um, alternative? Um, we're in the industry now. If 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 I was a clothing maker, most of them is making hoodies because that's the most popular thing to make. Very seldom that you'll probably see what jackets or my daughter. She's I mean, you look in their closet, everything is hoodies. And so what, what are the alternatives? Do we, what are we saying that they, could, that they could wear, you know, outside of a hoodie? I think the sweatshirts with no hoodie. I mean, there are sweatshirts with no hoodies. Um, Three-quarter zips. Three-quarter zips, big right now. Um, that was our most popular fundraiser. We did one every year, and it was, we, we did a three-quarter zip, and we've done hoodies before, too, but the three-quarter zip, they like. And honestly, I, I don't know if it's... They like the hoodies or the three-quarter zip, so they don't have to wear the collared shirt. I think that's probably the biggest issue. Well, they don't wear that. Yes. Well, I mean, that's, that's what that's issue. that's what I said. The only reason we don't have a 14-year-old standing right here protesting is because I wouldn't tell right. him to Target to buy the poster board. Right. <laughs> so well, I mean, he, he, was he was coming to protest happy. tonight yeah. because of that hoodie. And then when I explained to him, I said, "But what if you didn't have to wear that collared shirt? And what if you didn't have to wear the belt?" And he was like. I'm totally fine with that. Right. So I would hope that maybe we could compromise on this and know that, that things change. I also know that I've probably talked to 15 districts this week who are doing the same thing. We are not alone in this. The big ones are doing it too. The DISDs, the Fornies, they're all doing it as well. So I know that we're not, my, my only concern is that it's if it's not an action item, um, I think it, if we're going to do it, we need to just buck up and do this because it needs to get out there and we need to let parents know, we need to let custom tees know and all the ones that provide children with these sweatshirts, we have to let them know now. Yeah. And again, I, I don't know that I feel, I, I have to listen to teachers. I'm not on campus. So when you guys and the teachers tell us this is a problem and we need help, then we need to help. And if we, and if we you know, we go, if we go this route, and if it's still an issue, then it's another problem. You know what I'm saying? So all we can do is just like try it. Eliminate it. Yeah, if something happens where it's still, we still got issues, then we need to do something different. So let me just check to make sure I'm understanding here. Um, so we're saying students do not have to wear belts if they have on their sweatshirts. What about with the t-shirts? 
do we keep the belt requirement with the t-shirts or will we do away with that? Hey, Y'all make me nervous about, about these belts because need, some of these I kids, belt, some of these kids, and they sagging and all. They still, I mean, I. I well, I could, couldn't couldn't you still send them to the office if they're sagging? Right. Yeah. You get a zip tie. That's what made me about I this. mean, I we'll zip tie you. Again, I, I mean, I, they to me, <clears throat> this is just my opinion. Administration is there to take. Right now, I think we need to take care of discipline. Yeah. And I just, I mean, I realize they lead to others. But I don't know that looking at their belt would need to be my first priority every morning. But y'all could tell me different because I don't know. But I don't think the teachers should have to police yeah. it either. So it is, the, the question is, if if you have on a t-shirt and it's tucked in, do the, okay, do the t-shirts have to be tucked in? No. 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 Okay, then you don't see the belt. Right. And with, right. And with a sweatshirt, you don't see the belt. Correct. So the problem's over. Okay. Good. We have one more area that seems like something we should address within this, and that is matching sock requirement. It's very stylish to not match socks. That seems like a little bit of trivia yeah, that's is. just left over to me. Okay. I would be fine with taking that okay. out as well. So let me ask you all a question. Um, the dis these districts that take away cell phones, they take away the earbuds, have they mentioned watches? Because that's the next thing. I mean, let's be honest. That's that, that's what I'm worried about. It's okay. Because ninety percent of them probably are going to be if if you turn the cell phone off, right? The 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 Apple Watch is not going to work unless they're paying for the cellular data. Now I don't know how many of our children do that, but. Yeah, I'm too cheap myself to yeah. do that, so I'm just letting that out there. But, um, Mr. Doran, you're shaking your head now. You don't think? No, I, I don't think that's an issue. Here's the thing about cell phones, and it's like anything in dress code. Anything that you add that is small like that is just it's just a small like Dr. Frost talked about looking at socks. I'm gonna be honest with you, like. <laughs> That's something that's not going to be, you know, uh, it's right. just not a priority. Like, if they show up to yep. school and they're ready to learn and their socks don't match, I'm going to high okay. five them and send them to yep. class. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just don't want to have things in there that we're not going to enforce. Let's that's just right. take just this opportunity yes. to cut Absolutely. out the things that don't need to be Absolutely. in there. Yep. I agree. In my opinion, if you want to know my opinion, which means nothing, but, like, cell phones, I, I think that's a big, it's a big chore. I think you leave that to the teachers in their classroom management. Uh, leave it to us in the hallways and at, at the cafeteria. Um, I just, I don't, if you ban them, it's going to be, I mean, it's just hard. Yep. It's gonna be so hard. we empower, we empower our teachers yep. to, to. Yeah, because let's be honest, and we say that when you get into the real world, uh, Ms. Kelly, that, that we don't have phones, go to the teacher, go, when we have teacher in service mm -hmm. and we're talking, just just look out there at the teachers and see how many people are on the phone. Mm -hmm. So we say that, and we're on our phone. Like it's a it's a world thing. It's not just the kids. Like we're all the same way, honestly. Like so, uh, I would hate hate to tell my teachers that have hey, them Hey, kids can't have their cell phones. We're not gonna have ours either. Don't bring them in the building. I appreciate you saying that. That's not <laughs> I, Well, and I, I don't yeah. think it's. Oh, that's so loud. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love that. That's not a response. Like it's not a concrete. No cell phones. Yeah. No this. Yeah. I like that. It's up to the teachers. And um, when you see a problem, you create the discipline. Yeah. You address it. You yeah. fix that. Versus having rules that. Apply because they're already doing that. Yeah. They're doing that. I like that. I like that a lot.
Okay, I'm, I'm going to request uh, Mr. President and um, Superintendent Frost to make the current modifications to the Student Code of Conduct 2223. Um, we, my information request would be to eliminate hoodies from the dress code for safety purposes. So hoodies would not be allowed during the school day on campus. Second item would be a spirit shirt or collared shirt would be appropriate daily. It just wouldn't have to be collared. It could be a spirit shirt or a solid tiger colored t-shirt. What do you think? Or would you prefer it to be spirit? I just think spirit. Spirit yes. shirt or collared shirt. Collared shirt. We'll get, we'll get off, we'll get off track. Okay. Yeah. Number three, um, shirts do not have to be tucked in no matter the grade. So that would eliminate the 5 through 12 um, tucking in of the shirts. Four, we would eliminate the belt section within the dress code. Just eliminate it totally, and then also eliminate optional. the socks or optional the socks section inside the dress code. Do we even need to address the belts? Because, like they say, if, if they're if their shirts are covering the belts, and just delete it. We just delete it. Delete it. We just don't put anything in there that there becomes a discussion or something for it's them optional. to get yeah. as optional. Yeah, optional. There's another in the dress code. It says you cannot allow your pants to sag or dragging those sorts of things. So that's already in there. Taking out the belt part only eliminates the requirements for belts. It doesn't allow students to do that. It just takes that belt requirement out of there. So just so that I am I'm clear, we'll be voting on these changes for the student code of conduct at the next meeting, which is not until July, because we'll need to write that as an action item. However, it's this, I think, my personal desire, y'all can speak for yourselves, is that we would make these five changes to the dress code going forward in 22-23. And so what I'll do is the student code of conduct, I mean, in the student code of conduct, the dress code section will reflect these modifications along with the other um, legally required modifications to the student code of conduct. And you'll have that for an action item on the 11th. And, and um, can we address or make that public along obviously this meeting will be public um, mm -hmm. shortly but I'd make that public as well yes. before the vote sure that, that is a vote that's being considered yes thank you all gentlemen I appreciate you coming answering our questions well there was something what about backpacks we're going to talk about backpacks Well, backpacks. Um, that was something that was brought up last time. <laughs> it was brought up. Um, I think Ms. Branch made a lot of good points last time about the clear backpacks. Um, I don't know. Well, Kathy, would, yeah, yeah, would you like to speak? Is my mic still super loud? <laughs> okay. Um, so personally, um, I am, and I actually would love to hear the principal's ideas as well on this topic, but. Um, we had talked about getting gun and knife detectors before this the backpack conversation came up. Um, if we're still looking at getting those for our campuses, um, I don't see that it's necessary to have clear backpacks. Um, I think it's, um, I think we have a lot of other ways for guns to still be brought in instead of just a clear backpack. You have sports bags, you have jackets that you can put them in. You can actually still put them in clear backpacks. So that doesn't eliminate guns being brought into the school in a backpack. Um, so that's some of my thoughts on it. Um, some schools have them and there's a lot of restrictions and different things. Um, and so when you look at the pictures from other districts, you're looking at a uh, a backpack and actually I had a laptop case earlier some of the restrictions were that you could put lap case, laptop cases in your backpacks and so you do you put a laptop in your backpack you put a pad of paper next to it and anything can go in between there mm -hmm. you can get hollow books and put things inside of there you can get your jacket wrap it up and put it in a backpack there are so many ways still to bring it in so I um, I just I lean away from clear backpacks um, until we 
see if they're needed after we get the gun and knife detectors installed and actually see how those all work if that's the route we're going. Um, I would love to see all that before voting on clear backpacks. Yes. That's my thought. I just, I just also, you know, reflecting back um, on the belt, I'm sorry, I just, it's hard for me to get away from it because um, if, we're, if we're preparing them for the real world, um, I think we should send them out real prepared. And then if we're going to talk about safety, um, if I got my shirt tucked in, you'll know if I got a gun on me. If I don't have my shirt tucked in, then you'll know, you won't know if I have a gun on me. So right. I think you still have opportunity. I think we really need to revisit that and think about that. Um, right. when, when we talk about the untucked shirts, um, there's just so much that can still be covered up if, if we don't use it. So. That's just my thoughts on that. Do the principals have any thoughts on clear backpacks on if you think it would help the safety? I think if you have the, the metal detectors or the weapon detectors, um, it might not necessarily be necessary. What does make me nervous at times, and I think about this before every sporting event, is I have a clear back in sporting events. <coughs> You know, and that's just not, not just kids, adults, adults. too. Um, they come in, we don't we don't know these people. Like, right. A certain student comes in, um, you know, I might know, like, okay, he's acting mm -hmm. you know, normal or he has on like a really big trench coat, that's weird. Like, mm -hmm. I'll kind of register in my brain, but if a stranger walks in um, trying to conceal something, a backpack or, or whatever, um, it's really hard to know. So I'm kind of always. And yeah, we are open, open carry state. I mean, I know mm -hmm. we open carry. But when people say they, if they're, li if they're licensed to carry, if they gonna carry, they gonna carry. I mean, I know we have all kinds of signage and everything like that, but it, you know, it is the way of the world, you know. And so, um, like I said, we, it's just a hard discussion. It's really well, hard I think that to have. the devices we were considering are mobile, correct? So yeah. we'd be able to have those That's at correct. every sporting event, at our football games, and we could definitely implement clear bags. Uh, okay. Policy yeah. at yeah. our sporting yeah. events. I mean, it's, I mean, it's everywhere yeah. anyway. Because I mean, the, even stadiums right. require, right. you know, so the weapons the detectors, yeah, are, are mobile. So yeah. we could definitely do that. Yeah. Um, so, so the clear backpacks, I think, a couple things, they're hard to get, uh, for one. Um, and again, if we're going to have the, I, I agree with what uh, Brad said. As far as the shirt stuff in, uh, if, if you're going to go to a, a tuck rule, then you really can't wear sweatshirts because because you, you can't tuck in a sweatshirt. So like we, we've never you can, had. I mean, you can hide a gun in the, under a sweatshirt or a jacket. Well, that's my deal. Like with, with the hoodies, uh, they were never tucked in, and uh, no, it's, that's a tough. And I get I get what everyone's saying on hiding, but. Uh, that's a tough deal. That's a tough deal tucking in. Yeah. I mean, we can do it, uh, but, but I think you have to eliminate any shirt that is not tucked, which would be sweatshirts. I mean, coats. I think it's yeah. kind of like the clear bags. If they're going to pass through that weapon detector, um, it's very, very good. Trust that it takes something in. Yeah. I think it's sad we're to the point that yeah, we're having to just right. have yeah, this hour-long discussion anyway, mm -hmm. but it is what it is, and we have to discuss it, so, I don't know. And if it doesn't work, we, we can always come back and change it. Yeah. I mean, that's what we have to keep doing, right. is just right. putting things. forth an effort and doing what we can. Okay. So, are we good? I mean, all right. So Dr. Frost will, and I will come back with that with the new student code of conduct. All right, next we're gonna to go to the safety and security bond discussion. So we received some very good information, um, very good news today. Um, the Texas Education Agency is allowing us to um, change the ESSER funds that we were hoping to use for the weapon detectors and they notified us of that today. So with that information, 
What we're able to do is to purchase, um, if the board sees fit, 30 um, weapon detectors. Um, the recommendation currently is, um, <clears throat> as I will describe, I did this by prorating the attendance on the campuses. And I thought it might make a difference with the elementary numbers, but it really didn't. So um, the recommendation is 10 for the high school, four for the middle school and intermediate school, two at Navarro, Bowie, Carroll, Bannon, and Sam Houston, one at DAEP, and one at the administration building. And each one of these um, you can move. So we can move them to football games, baseball games, um, any kind of other venues. They're all um, portable. Um, you have the um, bid from the company that makes these weapon detectors at your place, so you can see the totals there. Um, they're expensive, but they're something that we talked about with metal detectors in the very um, almost impossibility of getting students into our schools in a timely manner. We'd have to um, have different grade levels coming in at different time and have them staffed all the time that students were coming in. So these, um, as you can see, I think on the top of that second page, it says that um, it's almost zero errors. And so what they trigger is um, alerts on knives and guns only. So they're not metal detectors, they're weapon detectors. Um, we believe that this would be the most um, effective and efficient thing to do. It's a separate handout. How long would it take for those for these to come in? I asked them when I called them this afternoon, and what we had already told them that we thought we wanted ten, and we didn't know that we, about how much money we were going to be allowed. And so with this with this number, we will we should be able to get those in five to six weeks, which would get them here and on campuses and our training done before school starts. Are these the, this, this is the same um, ones that um, Officer Stevens talked about that they use at the Dos Equis Pavilion? Um, these are the, the same this, company? It's the same company. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. It's just updated numbers. Right. And they were very good to get, they gave me about a 30 minute turnaround on this information. So we feel comfortable with them working since they're using them at right. huge venues. concert halls, venue yes. halls, things yeah. like that. I think, the, I think you already said that the SEC now on yeah. every venue yeah. is going to be using these exact same detectors that everything that has an SEC, boys right. and girls, athletics. So mm -hmm. that's huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. All righty. So. That is an action item, so I will entertain a motion to purchase these. I make a motion that we approve the purchase of 30 metal weapon, weapon detectors for the CISD campuses, DAP, and administration building. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to purchase 30 weapon detectors for CISD, all of CISD campuses. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The ayes have it. We will purchase 30 new weapon detectors for the start of the school year. Thank you. All right. Any additional agenda items? Well, can we um, stay on safety and security for just sure. a second, please? Um, since safety and security is number E on our agenda, I'd like to address um, two questions from the public um the public comment mm -hmm. mr holm i can't address this so your first question was how much was spent on the school bond um 95 percent which could be even higher i'm not sure was um from private citizens so the political action committee um cis uh was it cisd bond for kids yes. Uh, oh, yes, oh, yes for, yes. for yes. cisd kids um they privately funded all of the um information that you received in your homes the um there was like four or five um, mailers mailers that went out all of the um signs were also public um, privately funded as well and that group um, got together back in 18 and formed actually they were formed for the last bond that passed 
and they kept and they had a balance in that account from my understanding. I'm not associated um, with that account, but from what I understand, there was a balance in there. And then they collected a significant amount of funds back in 19 when we were going to go out to bond again when COVID shut us down. You know, the, um, the plan was to go uh, November of 20. So they had already collected the money to do all of that advertising promotion. And remember, a political action committee can t address and persuade a vote what, where a, a school district cannot. So that's exactly where that PAC, uh, the PAC, came in. And I will tell you that Father Ed Monk was chairman of that PAC, and Dr. Charles Biltz was the treasurer. So they they paid for all, all of that was paid privately so i can't address that and then i'd like to address what mrs jordan said um i absolutely absolutely um and i while i wasn't on that group that's just what i, I mean i was there at a couple of meetings and i wrote my own check so i can tell you that much <laughs> um mrs jordan on number two um i agree with tracy very much that i feel like we need to have a um some type of safety officer on every campus all day long, regardless of that is Bowie, Sam Houston, or Corsicana High School. Um, while I think that we all tend to believe that those things happen at um, older campuses, Uvalde told us that they do not, and Sandy Hook told us that they do not. And so I think it would be um, just, I couldn't look myself in the mirror at night if I didn't tell you guys that I think that if we have to make some cuts somewhere else, we're gonna have to, because I think that that is, um, we have to have at least someone on those campuses at all time. And I also believe that it's not just safety. I think that there's a really um, building of relationships there that are important for those students and those little students to see. I think that they learn early on that, you know, Officer Swanson is my safety. He's my person. You know, I can go to him with anything. He's going to always protect me, you know? And so I think that that's a relationship, and I think that that is counseling. I mean, there, it's just so much more than just, I'm going to get my gun out and shoot a bad guy, you know? And, and I'm concerned. I've, I mean, I've got nephews that are little. I'm concerned about what they're growing up and knowing. You know, I didn't grow up thinking that a man was going to walk into my campus and shoot me. I don't, I don't, I didn't grow up that way. I didn't have that fear, but I think they have different fears than we do. And I think it's our responsibility to do that. So, you know, whether that is a full-fledged police officer or it's a safety officer, I don't know. But I think that someone has to be on those campuses anytime those doors are open um, just for more issues than just safety. So that would be my request is that inside of this safety and security discussion um not really a bond but a safety and security discussion that i think that these weapon detector detectors are certainly our first our first big but i think that we also need to look at how we can make sure that those campuses are taken care of at all times and to answer another question that you posed miss jordan uh, we've put together a safety and security committee that will actually look at this okay so and a lot of you, Valdi, I mean, it's kept, it's kept me up at night because um, I had some friends that it affected. So, um, and they lost a grandchild, so an employee of mine. So, and Tracy, yeah. and Tracy, I want to say this because I've worked around police officers for 35 years. I think that's the purpose of that committee. Thank you. Okay. okay, is everyone good with that? So thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. All right. Additional agenda items for the July. Shouldn't it be the eleventh? I think it's the eleventh.
I believe it's the 11th. We so, changed it to 11th. Yeah, we it's did. It's the 11th. It's the 11th. We, we, yeah, we changed it. We could go ahead and put in a 25 if we needed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We changed, we moved our board meeting to the 11th, so in case we needed to do something. So. Is there any additional items? If you don't have anything right now, you've got until the You've got until the seventh to get it to us, so we can post it by the eighth. Mm. They will, the district will be closed the week of the fourth. Correct. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. so, so, so you really you need to do it before then. But the superintendent will be available, and we will be getting word June thirtieth. So, we'll right. so if there's any additional items, it needs to really be by June thirtieth because the district will be closed. Good. So, all right. All right. We're going to move on to the consent, ag consent agenda. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Okay. Uh, that's who he's going to get. That's who he's going to get. Yeah. Will you talk to Ms. Miller? Yeah. Okay, do we aye? Yeah, we all said aye. Yep. All those in favor say aye. Yeah, aye. We all said aye. Ayes have it. We're going to go into closed session uh, under uh, permitted by Texas Governance Code, Section 551.01.